Board of Ed Academic Standards and Assessment Committee meeting. Um, it is April 13th, 9.32 a.m. Um, we'll start out with approval of the uh, minutes of the last meeting. Is there a motion? For approval. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, I'm going to abstain because I believe that I left a little early for that meeting, correct? Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ajit, the agenda is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clemens, and thank you, board members, for joining this uh, subcommittee meeting. Uh, the first uh, agenda item that we have is our new universal screener for social emotional learning. I'm uh, now going to turn it over to our division director, Glenn Peterson, to lead this agenda item. Glenn. Uh, thank you, Ajit, and thank you very much, board members, and uh, for the guests who are here with me, thanks again for coming. Um, we actually got a charge about a year ago from uh, then Deputy Dire Deputy Commissioner, I believe, uh, Charlene Russell Tucker, to uh, to look for and procure a uh, SEL related screener. And um, I'm sure she had learned about this through her work with Castle, the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning. Um, you know, she was very involved in all that kind of work when she was the chief operating officer, as were uh, John Frasinelli and I, and uh, of course, Kim Traverso, who, uh, who actually uh, reports to John. But in any case, we, um, I started doing some research uh, last spring, uh, particularly talking to people at Castle, seeing if any other states were doing something like this. And um, they weren't aware of anyone. And um, we'd heard that Wisconsin was doing um, some SEL screening, perhaps statewide, but uh, strictly related to a curriculum that they were doing. So um, I, I talked to people, a few people in other states, and we frankly didn't know if any of these testing companies had the capacity to do 200 school districts and perhaps up to half a million or so students. And so uh, last summer, Kim and I, uh, well, mainly Kim and I was kind of overseeing, uh, wrote an RFI, a request for information, and we put it out to the field and got um, not really proposals back, but uh, responses back from seven or eight different uh, testing companies. But our basic questions were about the capacity. Could you handle 200 school districts and maybe half a million students at some point in the future with some kind of flexible spending, meaning we didn't want to just give you, you know, X number of dollars a year. We wanted to do this in a way that, um, you know, if, if only 20 districts were starting, we only wanted to pay for that number of districts and that number of students. So um, we asked for proposals or uh, uh, information about rollouts and things like that as well. So that RFI was a preliminary to putting out an RFP, a request for proposals. And the, all the companies that responded to the RFI responded to the RFP plus a couple more. So I think we had eight or nine, maybe Kim can correct me, um, responses um, in the fall when we did the RFP. And frankly, we were very, very interested in the DESA already. It's being used in the three Project AWARE districts in Connecticut. And frankly, we wrote the RFP to be like the DESA because someone else might have had one that was better, but we knew that was kind of the basic thing that we were looking for. So, um, so that's how this process started. We then, um, it was very clear to us, there were four of us on the uh, review team, myself, Kim, uh, Scott Nugas, and Amanda Pickett, who report to me. Um, it was very clear that the DESA was head and shoulders ab above the rest. Um, most of them didn't really have a screener. They had a, a bank of questions and would pull together questions to become a screener, but that wasn't something that had been in use for some any length of time or, or tested and things like that. So, um, so I did present to the board last week, and I don't want this to be me talking. I'd like our guests to do most of the speaking. But um, Kim, let me ask: Do you have anything you'd like to kind of add at this point? No, actually, you're right on target, Glenn. Thank you. Okay, I'm sure. Just very excited. <laughs> yeah. So um, we finalized the contract. Boy, 
it must have been right at the end of last month or right at the beginning of, of April. I don't know the exact date, um, but you know that was a lot of work getting that over the finish line. Uh, but since then, we've been uh, meeting with the folks from Aperture Education, including Jen, uh, multiple times a week, uh, it seems, because we're uh, trying to get the rollout going. Um, I think you've all seen the uh, the press release that went out a few weeks ago. And um, I don't know if you've seen, you know, uh, we sent out an informational guide that Kim wrote along with, I guess, uh, kind of the, the point person at Aperture uh, that's working with us to all the superintendents about information sessions that are starting next week um, relating to uh, use of the DESA in signing up and things like that. So, um, Jen, why don't I uh, roll this over to you? Um, I know you have some slides and you'll be sharing your screen. And once you're done, um, I maybe we'll leave, I'll leave a little space for questions right then. And then we'll go to Denise, who is, um, she is the project aware coordinator in Naugatuck and she oversees the use of the DESA in Naugatuck. And that's um, very much why we're having her here. And and uh, because I also oversee project aware, um, Denise and I have been at a lot of meetings like this for the last, uh, well, in person before in uh, the last year like this. So uh, thanks to both of you. And Jen, why don't you uh, start sharing your screen and we'll get going. Great. Thank you so much, Glenn. Um, so can everybody see my screen in PowerPoint mode? Yep, I've got it. Great. Great. Okay. Yes. okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jen Robitaille. I am the Director of Research and Development for Aperture Education. Um, and you know, speaking on behalf of my team at Aperture, we are thrilled to be partnering with you all. And uh, really, you know, Connecticut is leading the <laughs> leading the way in in terms of doing SEL statewide. So we are we are just really excited to be a part of it. Um, I am going to speak uh, very briefly a little about, share a little bit about the DESA with you all and uh, some of the initial steps we are taking to roll out the DESA this coming fall in the first cohort of Connecticut districts. So a little bit about Aperture before I jump in. Uh, we are focused entirely on social and emotional learning um, and our approach to SEL is one that is a strength-based approach and one that's data-driven and ultimately providing data to schools and districts uh, in order to inform the instruction provided to students ultimately to improve students' social and emotional skills. Um, the cornerstone of our approach um, is the DESA assessments, which I'll be talking about a little bit this morning. Um, but we also provide a variety of reporting to provide school staff, including teachers and counselors and administrators, with insight into their students' social and emotional skills, ultimately to drive instruction. And so another part of our system is a variety of strategies that teachers and counselors and other staff can use to build students' social and emotional skills. I'm going to focus on the assessment piece, though, this morning. So the DESA measures um, are a suite of nationally standardized, norm-referenced, strength-based behavior rating scales for students K through 12th grades. Uh, they are all measures of social and emotional skills. So they're strength-based in that they measure positive behaviors, desirable behaviors, desirable behaviors, things we want to see students engaging in. Uh, there's sort of two forms, um, the first being the DESA Mini, which is the brief universal screener. And then there's also the DESA, which is our follow-up in-depth assessment of students' social and emotional skills. A little about the DESA Mini. Uh, so the DESA Mini provides a snapshot of a student's overall social and emotional competence. It's primarily completed by teachers across K through 12th grades. Um, because it's a universal screener, it's designed to be very brief. It's only eight items in length. It takes teachers one minute to complete per student. That was intentional. We wanted teachers to be able to sit down and, and rate their entire class in one planning period. Uh, it provides one overall score, uh, the overall total score, uh, which is presented as a T-score uh, with descriptive score ranges. Uh, so because it's a strength-based tool, high scores represent social and emotional strengths. We call that the strength range. Uh, scores in the middle range are typical scores, and then low scores indicate a need for SEL instruction for the student. 
The primary use of the DESA Mini is to universally screen an entire population of students just to quickly and accurately check in and identify students who might be um, in need of additional SEL instruction. The DESA Mini can also be used for progress monitoring. So there's actually four alternate forms with different sets of items that can be used interchangeably throughout the school year. So teachers and staff can check in to see whether students are acquiring the social and emotional skills that are being taught to the students. And then lastly, it can be used pre-post uh, for outcome evaluation purposes. Here is what the DESA Mini looks like. Uh, it might be a little hard to see here. This is what it looks like when administered in our online system. Um, so a, a teacher, I mentioned it's a behavior rating scale. So a teacher would be reflecting on the last four weeks that they were with the student and they would be responding to the set of items on the scale from I never see this behavior occur to I very frequently see the student engaging in this behavior. Uh, a few of the items, again, all of the items are positive behaviors. Um, so teachers are rating things like whether the student um, or how often the student does something nice for somebody, um, how often students speak about positive things, contribute to group efforts, uh, show care when doing a project or schoolwork. So again, positive social and emotional skills we want to see students engaging in in the classroom. The way the DESA Mini, we recommend the DESA Mini to be used is that we recommend that uh, schools um, ask teachers to screen all of their students. Um, they screen their entire classroom of students using the DESA Mini. Uh, for those students who fall within the need for instruction range, um, we recommend teachers do a follow-up full DESA assessment to provide specific information about the student's unique social and emotional strengths and needs. And that's the information that really helps teachers um, inform instruction for students. Uh, approximately 16% of the students in a typical population would be um, assessed with the full DESA. And then a little bit about the DESA. The DESA is our detailed follow-up assessment of students' specific social and emotional competencies, also completed by teachers. Uh, there is also a parent form for parents to rate their child's social and emotional skills, as well as a student self-report for high school. Uh, because the DESA provides more detailed information, it's a bit longer. It's 72 items for K-8, 43 items for high school, and that's because it provides much more detailed information. You get nine scores with the full DESA, an overall total score, as well as eight scale scores. So it will provide information on students, um, how students are doing in relationship skills and self-management and goal-directed behavior, for example. Uh, the full DESA is used really to get a comprehensive understanding of students' specific social and emotional skills, which is ultimately used to guide SEL instruction for students. So you can meet students where they are and uh, select strategies and interventions to support that student's specific needs. And it can also be used for outcome evaluation for both individual students and groups of students and continuous quality improvement um, efforts. Uh, we provide a variety of different ways to actually look at the data. And again, the point being that the data should really be used to better understand students' current skills and inform instruction. So this is just a snapshot um, for an individual student's DESA scores. The teacher can quickly look to see how a student is doing um, across these different social and emotional skill domains to inform instruction. Um, as well as do the same, we provide data aggregated at various levels. This is a snapshot of a classroom profile. So a, a teacher could look quickly to see the students in their class as the rows and look across all of these social and emotional skill domains and quickly kind of get a big picture for students across their classroom. Um, for example, goal-directed behavior here, we see a lot of students in red, which would indicate the need for instruction range. So a teacher would know that perhaps providing opportunities for their class, all, their whole class of students to set and achieve goals uh, would really benefit all students um, in their class or group. So that was my very, very quick overview of the DESA Mini and DESA. I'm happy to provide additional follow-up information. Um, I just have a few, a few slides here remaining about the actual use of the DESA Mini and DESA across Connecticut. 
Um, so we'll be rolling out two cohorts of districts uh, with the DESA Mini in the, in the upcoming school year. Uh, cohort one will include existing districts across Connecticut who are using, um, already using the DESA and DESA Mini as well as um, 25 new districts at a maximum um, who are interested in participating. And they'll be geared up, onboarded, and trained to do an, a first assessment in um, October, the beginning of the school year. And then uh, cohort two um, will be preparing for a um, spring rollout. Uh, this will include up to an additional 75 districts who are interested in participating in this opportunity. Uh, quickly just share a little bit about the process for signing up. Um, districts who are interested will attend an information session. Um, our first information session is coming up next week. Uh, I believe at last count we had over 100 folks already signed up for it. Um, they'll be asked after the info session will be asked to complete a, an application um, so we can collect a little bit of information from the districts about their interest and um, their demographics and as well to help us um, select those initial 25 districts. Uh, they'll be uh, following guidance both from um, the state team as well as the Aperture team for effective onboarding and implementation. We want these districts to be successful, uh, so we'll be providing a lot of support to them along the way, um, and we'll also be providing professional development to the districts. Um, we offer at Aperture a variety of professional development opportunities that are geared towards the role of the uh, person participating. So it's geared to teachers who are doing the ratings or school staff who are using the ratings or district staff. Um, they'll, they'll go through an introduction to the system where we'll, we'll, they will learn all about the DESA and the DESA Mini and how to use the system. And then once they've done their first rating, they'll have an entire session focused on how to actually use the data to drive instruction. Um, ultimately, really to set up all members of school and district communities to be successful in, in using these tools. Um, so thank you all so much. And if there's time, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think um, we should break that up. Meaning, uh, if anyone has questions, this is a great time for uh, yeah. Jen specific questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Jennifer. If you guys don't mind, I'm gonna. I, I have a just two quick questions, and then I, I'll um, will fill the group. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, two quick questions. One, is there a model to assess teachers in this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do not know we do not have a model to assess teach you mean teachers social and emotional competencies yeah i'm looking at the criteria of things that are that are measured um i would my first thought was uh the teachers who are in front of the children should be measured in this <laughs> um, the, uh, Mr. Clemens, that might be a, a, a thing we want to do, but it's not something that Aperture can do for Got us. Got it. All right, cool. Oh, it's not um, designed. Uh -huh. right. Got it. Um, thanks. And Glenn, you can call me Eric, please. Okay. Uh, all, right. <laughs> um, all right. And secondly, I'm trying to understand or square the idea of strength-based and desirable behaviors. And I know that there's there's some compatibility, but I, I, I don't understand it within this model. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I can speak a little bit to that. Um, and, and Glenn, if you want to jump in too. Yeah, and, and maybe we'll have Kim jump in too. Okay, cool. Do you, do you all want to go first? <laughs> well, yeah, let, let me just say a few things. We were specifically looking for a strength-based uh, assessment when we went out there. That was certainly one of the criteria. And we, um, in, in the RFP, we asked people to respond to that. Because um, a lot of assessments are deficit-based. What, mm -hmm. what can't the kid do as opposed to what do we want the kids to do and how are they doing along that road? Mm -hmm. So you heard Jen, Jen talk about the kind of questions in the DESA mini, and I've heard them a lot and I still can't remember them off the top of my head. But for example, has Eric said something positive about a classmate in the last four weeks? Well, that's, a you know, and, and maybe the teachers even because he or she knows the the assessment is looking for that, you know, because when I used to uh, monitor classrooms, I was looking for on task behavior and I'd stand there with a chart 
and think, all right, how much is off task? If I'm looking for on task, oh, he's not on task at the moment. Oh, he's back on, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so we specifically wanted this strength-based approach, not, you know, the the deficit based you know looking for kind of negative behavior bad behavior problematic behavior um kim uh, you're this is your ballywick more than mine so uh, i've learned from them so why don't you uh, have a go look you're muted i think i think um understanding the question too i what i think what he's trying to understand is weighing uh you know the strength based approach who is deciding what are those expectations of behaviors? Am I on the right track? Yeah. And so if that that is the great question, because that goes back to what you're talking about as far as uh, training and development for staff as well. And mm -hmm. the, the good news is, though, is that we're starting to go in that direction. So, Jennifer, I think if you could talk about one of the reasons why we selected the DESA was because of the equity piece because we wanted them to understand um, how this is equity-based SEL and not just, we have these expectations, we have uh, these routines of you know, what, what kids are supposed to do versus let's have an equity-based model where it's, it's a give and take with the student, more so in understanding the student's culture and how we are responsive to that cultural need and that's really why we went with the DESA. So Jennifer, if you could talk about the research that you've done around that, number one, but also how you've actually done the research on the demographics across the country in regards to this work. Uh, Kim, I'm going to piggyback because that was my question. Eric jumped ahead of me. Is the <laughs> instrument, can the instrument be biased? I wanted to make sure that you know we are not doing something that creates biases and and so thank you thank you for trying to address that issue i apologize stella but but i knew you would tear it all up so i <laughs> go ahead jennifer <laughs> yeah and you know i'm so glad you guys asked this question this is um you know something we get asked all the time it's a really important question and something that we have spent a great deal of time thinking about and analyzing and really digging into with the development of these tools. Um, and so I'm also, you know, I'll speak really quickly to some points. Um, and then I have a variety of resources I'm happy to share with like the full details as well. So I'm, you know, I'm happy to circulate that to the group. Um, so one of the first things we did in the development of these items um, as we were testing them, and this is going back with the, the K-8 DESA going back uh, uh, 2008 or so is when we initially developed this, the DESA. Um, we did put the items in front of um, individuals across a variety of um, uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds to, you know, really test out whether these items um, from a, you know, a face validity point of view uh, feel good for folks. Um, so that was sort of really quickly of the item development piece. Um, throughout the process of developing the assessment and the items, one of the key things we do is um, nationally standardize these tools. And so in the development of this, these tools, we always go out and collect a sample of ratings, um, either teacher ratings or parent or student ratings, depending on the form. Um, and we ensure that the um, standardization sample, which is ultimately where the scores are derived from, is representative of the um, US population in terms of a variety of key demographic areas. So we ensure that the sample is diverse um, in terms of um, uh, age, gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, which we define as free or reduced price lunch, um, as well as a geographic region of the US. Um, the goal there is to make sure that the sample is large and diverse, um, that's representing voices uh, from a variety of backgrounds and experiences. We also do a lot in terms of looking at score differences across subgroups of uh, students. Um, so for example, we take a look at uh, mean score differences across the scales and the total score of these assessments and actually look for differences uh, between different subgroups of students based on race and ethnicity. Um, we also, um, with the 
most recent assessment, we've looked at actually at the item level and look for potential differences at the item level across subgroups of students. Um, we've actually found no differences across um, across different subgroups of students at the item level in the actual responses of students. Um, so we have done a variety of things throughout the development and actually it's an area of um, something that we are continuously looking at and working on. Um, so that was my sort of quick answer. Again, happy to share follow up information with you all. Let me say one more thing. I don't know if um, you mentioned this, Jen, but um, these questions weren't just something that Aperture kind of made up and, you know, kind of thought of. Um, they're based on the CASEL competencies. And there are eight questions and five CASEL competencies. So um, three of the CASEL areas actually have two questions each in the DESA mini. And then two of the CASEL competency areas just have a single question. So they, they're, and that's another thing. In our RFP, we wanted something that was CASEL aligned um, because we've been doing a lot of work with CASEL for the last several years. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I, I was just thinking I didn't want to interrupt before, but um, there's there's so much rich conversation that's happening and I'm taking it all in and trying to remember all of the points to make sure that I can address the things that I know about. Um, so Mr. Clemens had asked about, you know, the staff readiness for this and what are their skills. Um, and it, to me, that's such a crucial component to rolling this whole thing out. So for us in Naugatuck, um, you know, we're fortunate to be part of Project AWARE. And so prior to the DESA screening, we had a full year of prepping our teachers on their own SEL skills using the ruler program, because that's what we're using for our tier one SEL uh, program. However, um, Aperture does have an add-on. I don't want to say add-on, depends on what, what, what package you get. Um, so the package that we were given through Project AWARE, we had like eight, I think, um, pilot or demo um, resources and it's called EdCert, it's through Aperture. And that includes um, self-reflective assessments so that teachers can kind of reflect on their own SEL skills. It includes um, professional and personal development plans, different strategies for the teachers. So if you know different districts wanted to add that on to their package that's given through the state, you know, maybe that's an option too, if they felt like they needed that type of preparation to get them ready to screen. Denise, thank you, because I, I thought I saw a ruler in your in your deck, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't want to assume, but I was going to ask about that. Thank you so much. No problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, Glenn. Yeah, one of the, uh, um, oh, goodness, I'm going to try to remember what, uh, what point I wanted to make. Um, one of the things that um, we are recommending to teachers or to <laughs> districts, actually, is that um, a majority of teachers in the district have um, a background in SEL prior to starting the DESA. Anyone can really volunteer, but as Denise was saying so eloquently, some folks might not quite be ready. But we feel that uh, a combination of factors, one is um, we did a survey of districts and almost all districts have some type of district SEL, if not program, at least expectation. So they have been doing some work on this. Um, but we also think that the um, the professional development program that Aperture is going to run, lay out with the DESA, including the things that Denise was talking about, will prep people adequately. Maybe not like a whole year of ruler training adequately, but enough to understand how can I help my students get better at these eight things that we're measuring. And, um, and Aperture does provide um, resources to help teachers do that. Thanks, Glenn. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Can morning. you define to me what is optimistic thinking? It, it was one of the, it was one, it was on one of the, uh, the, uh, the assessments, right? Yep, it is. What, the, what does that mean for us, for if I'm a student thinking that somebody is assessing me on optimistic thinking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so optimistic thinking includes items related to having confidence in yourself, having a sense of hope for the future, having positive thinking regarding school, their classmates, 
Um, uh, so those sorts of things. Um, it's actually, uh, it, it is a part of the Castle framework, but it was, we were very much influenced by the resilience literature and the positive youth development work um, oh. 10 plus years ago in the development of the DESA. And so we just are, you know, we know how important that sense of having optimism, both in yourself and others is so important to students in their development. Okay. So we, okay. yep, yeah, that's what that Th is. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm gonna start using that. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> the sense of hope, I heard that. Um, yeah. But I also have more of an intense question is that um, if we're looking at self-management, goal direct self-management, I'm using your language, right? Mm -hmm. um, how, how are we able to convey to even the student and their families how the progress has come along because we know that in high school the, the the students' hormones are going back and forth. We know that they go through they're like roller coasters, right? I mean, I, I had one at home, and so um so therefore my point is how are we going to communicate to to the students and their families if there's progress, if there's not, and then what? How we're gonna how are we going to uh, assist them with with those changes using this tool? Um, if you want me to speak to that a little bit, because I can I, I can tell you how we're doing it. And those examples. Yeah, um, Denise. Uh -huh. And it's actually, do you want me to just start presenting? Because I it's kind of in my my slideshow at, oh, with certain examples. Uh, okay. Maybe, but somebody else might have specific questions oh. for Jennifer. Perfect. Uh -huh. Can I actually, this is Malia. Um, I have a, a, a question related to the um, the sixteen percent figure that you had provided. And I'm just really curious as to if there are any sort of assumptions, expectations, theories, hypotheses about and the plan related to uh, COVID world may actually impact. And by looks on faces, I'm guessing I'm freezing. You did a little. <laughs> I will put my question in chat and maybe it can be answered later. Well, you know, let, let me just jump jump on that. This is actually stuff I've learned from Kim, but I don't mind speaking about it. Um, one of the things that we're doing a lot of is looking at multi-tiered systems of support. And I'm sure you've seen these triangles where tier one is kind of universal, um, universal implementation that all kids are getting. In fact, we're, we're using a, um, uh, a model like this for Project Aware. And then tier two are these more um, small group specialized interventions. And if you think of reading, you know, everyone gets the reading program, but some kids get extra tutoring because, you know, they're not thriving necessarily in the regular program. And then the top of the, the pyramid, tier three, are maybe students that need really extra special support. And it seems that in, in a lot of research that I've seen is that 15% or so are kind of the tier two and tier three, that the, the universal things we do for all students um, can meet the needs of about 85% of the students and that smaller percentage needs more. So I thought that was just very similar to the 16% that um, Jen was talking about um, with the DESA. Um. Malia has a question in the chat. I, I think it is the question she was trying to ask. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, our our hypothesis is that it's it's very possible that more students might be falling in the need for instruction range, just given all of the, you know, all of the things, the challenges that they've experienced with COVID, the impacts in their family life, their home life. It is very possible. Um, we put together um, last year, we put together a variety of resources for school staff, sort of trying to, to talk about that, think about that, communicate that, and looking at DESA scores this past year. Um, and uh, it is something that we are actually hoping to take a look at the data from this past school year and look to see um, you know, how DESA scores are impacted. So it's something we're hoping to be able to do over the summer to look into that very question. Yeah. Are we ready for Denise to, to share? Is there any other questions for Jennifer? From the from the board, no. All right, Denise, do you have anything left? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate your passion, though. I do. So go ahead. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> let me. Um, this is my first time using Microsoft Teams, so I'm hoping that I'm sharing this correctly. Um, I'm going to do my entire screen. 
Okay. Uh, looks looks everybody... like it's going to work. Perfect. Fantastic. Okay. So um, again, I'm the SEL coach for Naugatuck Public Schools. I'm also the Project Aware coordinator, and I'm very grateful to be here today to talk to you about how we're using DESA in our um, building our SEL framework across our district. So our goal was to uh, create a MTSS system for SEL that mirrors our reading and math academic content um, support. So what we did was we do a fall screening and a uh, spring screening, excuse me, spring screening using the DESA mini, the eight question screener. Um, students that score in need of instruction on that eight question screener, they get the follow up full DESA. Um, and like Jennifer said, that's a little bit more intensive. So where the eight question screener touches all five of the CASEL competencies and the two, uh, the three extra goal directed, optimistic thinking, personal responsibility, um, the full DESA is a 72 question screener that kind of digs a little bit deeper into each of those categories. So when you get the scores back from that, you can really have a, a more clear picture of what the student need is and what the student's strengths are. We then take that informa information and um, we review the data at a team meeting. So some of our schools have um, universal curriculum, like the ruler stuff that we're using. DESA also, like Jen, that, that you can select based on whatever strand you're working on. Um, or are we going to put the students into a tier two or tier three intervention, which goes to that question progress monitoring in between. So after six to eight weeks of intervention for tiers two and tiers three, we will do a follow up mini assessment. So another eight questions. What's nice about the DESA is that they have four DESA mini forms. We can now re-administer that DESA mini one, or if we want, we can put in a DESA mini two, which assesses the same skills, just with different wording of questions. So um, very, we're new in this process. Um, so I don't want you to think that we're an expert at this at all. This is year two for us. So we're still learning a lot as we're uh, moving along. Um, on that same progress monitoring document, we put a column for the outcome of the intervention. So once we get that follow-up screen, did we did the child make growth? And then another column that talks about what do we do here? Do we continue with what we're doing? Do we reduce the intervention? Do we increase the intervention? And then we just um, keep the, the process moving. So here's an example of one of the progress monitor documents from one of our schools. So here's where we would list the student name. Um, DESA gives you really detailed information. So this spreadsheet was is one of the um, standard reports in the system. Along with this, it gives you like every question and what the student scored. So what we do is we filter out and we look at just the information that we need. We use some conditional formatting here so that if the student scored in need of instruction, the box would turn up red. And if they were typical, it would turn up blue, just so you know it's easy for us to, to read. So for example, um, this student right here on the third line, you can see that after the, the full DESA, they turned up uh, typical in all of their strands, even though they scored in need of instruction on the first DESA mini. That's happened to us a couple of times, very rarely. Um, but what we've seen with that is, okay, so maybe when we look deeper at um, the student, it's not a severe um, deficit, but they've got definite strengths. So maybe for this child, we don't do a tier two or tier three intervention just yet. We continue with our tier one because it might be enough to pull them up. And then after that six to eight weeks, we reassess and see you know, what that child needs. Um, this is an example of the progress monitoring document. So um, this was broken up into our tier two interventions. So these are our small groups. This is what they're working on. So we're looking at the exact strand, the materials they're using, um, some notes, how long, who was there. So really we have all of that information to kind of guide our decision-making. These are the numbers from our screening last year and this year. So last year was supposed to be our, you know, our great like pilot year. Let's get this out there. We're gonna, we're gonna test it in grades five through eight, really get comfortable with it, set up the MTSS system, and then February rolled around and everybody knows that everybody shut down. So it really kind of, um, you know, we, we couldn't get that pilot year in fidelity. So this year is, is almost, a pilot year for us again, even though we had a little bit of like a, a taste of what DESA was last year. 
Um, so we screened, you know, over 2,000 students. You can see our percentages of who was in the strength category, the typical and the needed instruction. And then for our eight schools that screened, five of the schools reported after the progress monitoring um, six to eight weeks screen that 66% um, of the students in the interventions um, improved or 53% or 63, you know, so we were seeing some significant improvement, improvements after the first uh, progress monitor screen. Schools six through eight weren't able to um, get the interventions in place quick enough for us to do a six to eight week snapshot. So we're going to get their uh, outcome results when we do the May screen or universal. Um, these are just some things that to consider for districts that are using DESA for the first time. Um, you want to make sure, I know professional development training schedules in districts are very tight and there's not a lot of time and there's so many things that need to get done. So um, it's important for the administrators to know in advance that there needs to be time set aside for training for the site administrators for the district and for the teachers. So the site administrators are your school administrators, uh, for us, it's our, our school counselors, our psychologists, and our social workers. So our, our support teams, essentially. Um, a great implementation help to us was that our principals gave the teachers either PLC time, faculty meeting time, team meeting time, whatever it was, designated a certain day and time for them, that, for the teachers to complete the rating so that the teachers didn't feel overwhelmed, like, Oh my goodness, I have to find you know time during my prep or after school or whatever to fill out these screens. It was already built into the schedule for them. And that was just a huge relief um, for the teachers and, and was a, very helpful to us in the buy-in of it, of, okay, let's try this. Um, another thing to consider is who's going to complete the ratings. So in your elementary schools, it's easy teacher does it. But when you look at our middle school, we had to have a big discussion about well, who's going to rate these children because, you know, they see seven different teachers during the day. Um, so that's something to carefully think about. We decided to have the homeroom teacher do it because we are a teamed school. So the homeroom teacher has all the students um, on the team at least once a day. Another thing to consider is to share the data with the teacher. So that last slide that I showed you where it said 66% of students um, improved 54%. We take that data and we blast it out to the teachers and we congratulate them and the support staff and all of our, um, every opportunity that we could because we want them to see that they're not taking their, their precious time to fill out the screener and then it just kind of gets pushed away. It's, it's actually being used to inform decisions and instruction and it's making progress for the for the students. So for us, that was a big win. And it was it was great for the teachers to hear that feedback. And then finally, it's important to be flexible. So be flexible with the timelines. Like I said, things happen, pandemics, you know, uh, people get sick, whatever it is. With those timelines, we were super flexible um, last year and this year because we just didn't want to add stress in, in an already stressful year. Um, be flexible with your intervention. So look at what you have available to you. You have the whole DESA system where you've got um, interventions that are tailored to the each strand, whether it's optimistic thinking or self-awareness, but you've also got whatever you're already using in your school. So for us, it's ruler. Um, we've got, you know, second step is what's linked to DESA, I believe. Um, you could do mindfulness, anything's evidence-based. And then to also be flexible with technology. Um, so obviously there's going to be hiccups, technology there always is. So just, you know, be patient with it. What I can say is that the hiccups that we've come across, Aperture has been above and beyond in terms of customer support. Um, you know, I, I'm speaking with my representative who helps me with the technical stuff probably on a weekly basis, and he's very responsive. Um, and I've also given suggestions about, oh, what if we did this or can the system do this? And so... He's, he's taken my questions to the product development team um, just to, to make it as user-friendly as possible for teachers. Um, and I think that's it. So if anybody has any questions. Denise, I have a question. And thank you for addressing my, my questions about progress and sharing it with parents and the students. And I like, and I like the fact that you addressed my question. And also, are the teachers feeling overwhelmed because it's another you know, it's another assignment on there, but you said the homeroom teachers, you know, are, are responding. Uh, but are, are you able to, my question is, are you able to break it down by, um, I, I want to see patterns of gender and race 
as to as to um, how how this how our students are doing. Yes. Um, so um, yes, the the DESA aperture system is linked to our Power School um, oh. tech. Yes, I don't know what you call it, tech system, I guess. Yeah. Um, Power so the when you open DESA, the first screen you see is a bunch of graphs. And so you can filter those graphs by demographic, by socioeconomic status, by classroom, by you know, gender, anything. So you can really um, dig down and look at different patterns. That's excellent, excellent to know. Because I would be curious later on to have a conversation um, uh, as to what is what are the patterns, especially of our young uh, African American and Latino males, because because the commission knows that that's where my heart is because of you know of, of getting them ready for college and and they're more you know the the, the whole behavior issues that are going on in schools and so mm -hmm. forth, and so we've had conversations. But I would be I, it would be nice if we can have a follow up conversation to see what are the patterns with all students, but sure. specifically the first generation low income population. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Denise. Well, and uh, this is Glenn. Maybe we'll be able to do some of that statewide in uh, after next year. Yep. Thank you, Glenn. Yes. Any other questions? Um, this is Martha. Can I, have a, I have a question for uh, Denise, but it can be anybody. Thank you, Denise, for your detailed presentation because it answered a lot of my other questions from the intro. Um, I was just wondering how SEL plans um, fit in with the other plans a student may be on, an IEP or anything else um, that's already been identified for that student? So for us, um, what we did was that that spreadsheet that I showed you that had the red and the blue and you know all of those things. So what that'll do is show you every student who scored in need of instruction. And then what we do is we go through and we have a column for what intervention is already in place. So we'll look at students with IEPs, students with 504, and what specifically is happening for SEL in those plans. So if the IEP, if a student has an IEP, but they don't have social work in their IEP, okay, do we need to go to PPT to reassess that and see, do they need social work skills? Or can we take that child and put them into an evidence-based, you know, group counseling, you know, with the school counselor or something outside of that IEP? So um, we look at what's already in place and then we, we figure out what's the next what's the next step for them. How do we utilize this? Does that make sense? Yeah, Denise, I would like to add, this is Kim Traverso. I'd like to add also, this is a great opportunity uh, with the student success plans um, because we are looking at academic career and social emotional. And um, many of our staff struggle with setting up SMART goals for our students in sixth grade through 12 in regards to the student success plans for our social emotional learning. So this will help drive that and also um, identify and be able to monitor their progress within that area. Thank you, Kim. Um, another thing that I just thought of too was some of the, um, I don't wanna say stress, maybe anxiety or, or nerves around kind of doing this universally across our district was coming from our support staff and saying, what if we have this influx of need? How do we address it? And so what we found was, um, the majority of students that are coming up in need of instruction were already servicing. There was maybe a small percentage, a handful of students that we that kind of fell under the radar and we weren't giving intervention to, or they weren't seeing the counselor, they weren't, weren't seeing the social worker. So what this provided for us, which was you know kind of our goal, was data to drive that instruction in the intervention and to look at progress monitoring to know you know do we need to move them from a tier two to a tier three. So this was just a really good. It was a clearer picture for us, even though we were servicing the students. Now we have hard data to show, you know, this was their progress. This is where they're going. This is where we want them to be. So that was very helpful in creating the MTSS framework for us. Martha, any more Thank questions? You. I actually have a, a separate question going back to the uh, CSDE folks. What is pacing the rollout? Um, that we saw in the first slides, the first 25 and then the next 75 or whatever the numbers were. I muted rather than unmuted myself. Um, some of it was uh, frankly um, aperture capacity. And uh, this is a this is a new 
a large contract for them. And um, they're the ones that recommended 25 to start. And I think, frankly, that part of it is about getting our feet wet. Um, and you saw that the next group was 75. That's literally half of the districts in the state in year one. Um, and we have a three-year contract with these folks. Um, of course, it's you know extendable and all that. But um, and it's completely voluntary. So um, Jen said she thought there were about 100 people signed up for the first information session. Um, yesterday, I learned that there are about 60 districts and 130 people um, who are going to attend the first information session. Uh, and that's just the first of four. So um, the, the pacing is really about um, kind of us doing the marketing, which we're doing now. Um, we're getting lots and lots of calls. Um, Kim and I have been fielding. I haven't fielded. I haven't fielded dozens, but I think Kim has certainly fielded dozens. Is that right, Kim? Okay. Um, so part of that is um, there's been a huge increase in SEL interest among districts during this uh, pandemic year. And um, I think we're kind of seeing the results of that now. And that's really drive, you know, to a large degree driving um, the pacing. Martha, that's a great question. So so basically, Glenn, would it be fair for me to say that you all are piloting 25? Yeah, uh, kind of. But, you know, yeah, so what we what we try to do is essentially pay for aperture to have relationships with districts like the relationship they already have with Naugatuck and the other districts that are doing it. So we are not, we're, we're well, we, we are to some degree the intermediary, but we don't want to, you know, we want the aperture and the staff at aperture to have those direct contacts with districts that Denise was talking about um, earlier about, you know, she has weekly contacts with kind of her, her, I guess, rep, from from aperture and can really talk about things you know kind of at uh, at her district level you know we we weren't planning to be uh, fielding those types of questions okay. but uh, but we want districts to have that kind of relationship and we're paying for it so it's at no cost to districts and in also if the districts that are currently using it um you know want us to pay for it we'll we're going to be doing that too now, Naugatuck's in an interesting situation because they're paying for it through the uh, Project AWARE grant. But if we could take that cost off of their plate, which we're willing to do, they could use that money to pay for other things that Denise what might want treat. to do. That yes. is a lovely treat to hear on a Tuesday morning. <laughs> so it's, um, then it's well, you know, we're, we're willing to provide it to everyone in the state, and you're in the state, so it doesn't seem <laughs> fair if we wouldn't be providing it. So is it safe to say that Aperture is piloting 25 schools? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, but, you know, they've done this with thousands of schools before. So it's, uh, you know, um, but I, I think part of it is like getting all our, our, you know, getting our sea legs under us at the start. Um, if we can get, you know, even close to 100 districts this year, um, I, I really don't know what the appetite will be next year because we could literally have every district in the state trained in two, in two years based on, you know, 100 a year. Okay. Thank you. Martha, your hand's up. Was that previous or? Yes, it's from previous. Let okay, me see if I can it. take it down. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Eric, I just want to thank the uh, Glennon for the presentation. I thought at the board meeting we didn't have time to go into the details, and this really required more detailed information and yeah. ability to ask questions. So thank you for understanding. I wasn't my intention wasn't to cut you short; was really to give you more time for everyone to present and to let us understand what was going on. Especially, I think the issues of diversity, cost, results, all kinds of things that. Um, any sort of testing uh, entails, we wanted to make sure that uh, we knew and understood and can be supportive of what you're doing. So thank you again. Well, uh, thank you, Estella. And it was really our pleasure to be here. I've uh, I've been spending a lot of, in fact, I was just invited to go to the CABE board meeting on Thursday to talk to those folks as well. So it looks like I'm going on the road to talk about DESA. 
So, um, but um, thanks uh, to Kim, Jen, and uh, Denise. Uh, you did a great job, and I really appreciate you being here. So, um, oh, thanks, I, everybody. I, Thank you. I, I, I second yeah. Estella. It was, this was, you guys were, I mean, even the reading I, I just really provoked a lot of thought for me. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, it really did. It was great. So thank you well, so much. You informed me a, a lot on this. This is really, um, I think, pioneering work. Well, uh, Eric, you know, th thanks really, you know, it's really thanks to Charlene. She's the one who pressed this. She's the one who's really pushing the SEL agenda. You know, I'm kind of the operational guy, but, um, you know, this has been things that she's been wanting to do for several years. And um, it didn't all start recently when she became the you know, the acting commissioner, it's been going on for a long time. Thank you, Glenn. I just want to, Eric, I just want to mention that Malia is on the phone. Um, and I know she dropped off and she joined by phone. I don't know if she had any questions before. Oh, thank I you. Just, thank just, you. Just, uh, Thanks, Ajit. I appreciate it, Ajit. I don't have any questions, but I very okay. much appreciate this conversation this morning. Thank you. Sure. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take thank care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Ajit, are we adjourned? No, not so fast. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I don't have the luxury of having my an agenda in front oh, of no. me, so I apologize. Oh no, no, no worries. I was just kidding. Um, <laughs> so um, I had two other brief updates, so this shouldn't take long at all. Um, I wanted to share a, a couple of legislative couple of bills working through session this year, just to put it on your radar. There's a, so much going on, uh, but just wanted to get it, get it on your radar. Um, the first one, I'm putting the links to this in the chat as well. I had sent this to you ahead of time as well. The first one is uh, uh, Senate Bill 881. It's the governor's workforce bill. Uh, and there are a few pieces in there that I just wanted to bring to your attention, um, uh, just so that you're, you're aware. Um, Section 15 of this, I don't have a PowerPoint for this. So you, you know, you have the link to the bill and I'll, I'll let you sort of look at this, but just, just highlights. Uh, section 15 of this bill has something called a challenging curriculum policy. It expects each board to have a, each district to have a challenging curriculum policy that really pushes students to take more rigorous courses while in high school such that they take at least one AP, IB, or dual enrollment course uh, by their 11th grade uh, year. And it also expects that students who do well on the eighth grade assessment, the Smarter Balanced eighth grade assessment in ELA and or math, are automatically given access to these rigorous courses. Uh, so th that's kind of one of the policies that's in there, um, which we are uh, very much in support of, uh, but I just wanted to, to mention that. It aligns well with our college and career readiness efforts and also our uh, accountability system as well. Uh, it also includes a provision for uh, adding FAFSA completion as a graduation requirement. <laughs> I know you would like that, with exceptions, with exceptions, um, in cases where students are undocumented, or uh, students just don't, or parents just don't want to fill out the FAFSA. So there are exceptions and outs, very well uh, thought out um, outs, if you will. So those are in there, but it does um, uh, put that into uh, an uh, expectation, a requirement. Um, it also actually uh, allows for time during the school day to be used for completing FAFSA, to support for completing FAFSA, so that it's Again, reducing the burden on the on the district um, and the family and the student. Um, uh, the third, uh, it, it the other component of this is in parallel to the K twelve high school graduation requirement, it adds FAFSA completion to the adult education graduation requirements as well in in a very parallel form. So just to just to sort of mention that that's there. Uh, it also raises the age. Another component in this bill, 881, is it raises the age for withdrawal from high school. Currently, a 17-year-old can leave high school with parent permission. So a parent has to execute a withdrawal form. Um, but the um, uh, but this bill actually raises the age to 18. So it basically removes the ability for a 17-year-old to withdraw from 
uh, from high school so that they remain in school. And when they turn 18, of course, they're an adult and they can they can leave school. So there's that provision. And the last provision I want to bring to your attention is um, on the student success plan. I know this was discussed. uh, Kim brought it up in the prior section. Uh, The bill would also actually uh, mandate that the Department of Education collect some data from student success plans. Uh, in a few years. It's not immediate. It gives a three-year window uh, because currently we have no information or data about what is in these student success plans. What are their goals? Uh, what sort of, you know, in the three components that Kim mentioned, academic, uh, career, and SEL, we don't have really any insight into this. So we're, we're, it, it mandates the department to collect some data from these uh, student success plans. So that's another component that's in the bill. Um, And again, this is still proposed legislation that's still working its way through. Uh, We've had several conversations with the governor's office and with the education committee as well on on these uh, on this particular bill. Any questions on what I've said on this? Yeah, uh, Ajit, you mentioned I know they're proposed, but just just so I can uh, leave with with just some clarity for the financial aid, the application. Right. Who's going to in the schools? What is to talk about? Who's going to be responsible? The the counselors or the who? What? Because again, it's more work for for the folks. Are they going to add more staff, people that are experts that are trained in financial aid? Help help me understand that. Yeah, there is a fiscal note that's being drafted for this bill uh, because there is clearly an understanding that this is not without cost at the local level. Um, uh-huh. So there is a fiscal note that's being added. Uh, the governor's office is also exploring ways to set up. Uh, supports for districts um, through partnerships with organizations that would bring no cost, at least to the from the district's perspective, it would be no cost to have external entities who are familiar with uh, financial, fiscal, tax preparation type supports to the to the high schools. Uh, mm-hmm. But it is, uh, you know, it is kind of a train that's uh, we we know there is a demand and there's a challenge at the local level. But there's also momentum nationally that this is something that just needs to happen, and we just need to find a way to do it. Um, right. So I think there's that recognition as well. Yeah, I like what you said, and also, you know, you know, we we have community colleges, higher education settings, where maybe because we have financial literacy now in, in institutions, maybe you know, hopefully we can we we can have discussions with higher education institutions about how we can partner. Like back to what you said. And and it's and it's also it could be an enrollment a recruitment piece too for institutions. Mm-hmm. Okay, but thank you, Ajit. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions on this bill? Okay, the other bill that's uh, also working its way um, through uh, through the legislature is is Senate Bill nine seventy seven. Uh, Irene and I are. Um, tag teaming on this. Um, and I put the link to this bill in the chat as well. Uh, and very briefly, Irene, I'll mention a few points and then please feel free to jump in. Uh, basically, it expects the CSDE and it's about virtual learning. And it expects the Department of Education to publish standards for virtual learning by this July. And we've already put out a ton of guidance under Irene's leadership. So that's already out there. Uh, it expects us to sort of put guidance, uh, the standards out there for virtual learning. It expects us to do a full-on audit of what virtual learning has happened for the past two years, really from March of last year, uh, so that school year and this school year. It expects us to do an audit of that, update the standards based on the findings from that audit. Uh, it expects districts to provide professional learning for teachers, and also it expects that these virtual learning sessions will count as school days uh, toward the 180 day expectation. So so those are some of the pieces in this bill. It's a ton of work that that Irene is leading. Irene, uh, I'll pause anything you want to add at this point. No, other than that, what has been helpful is um, we were able to work with the committee to provide substitute language and adjust the timeline to um, come together in partnership around this work. Um, It is aggressive, but again, what we've 
added to it, we think that can be done based on the good work that we've done as a, an agency to provide um, guidance since March. So it's all present and ongoing. This really opens the door for virtual learning to continue past the COVID year, but with some um, some frames and, and guardrails and guidelines. Yeah, and, and that should inform also the strategic plan because that should be a component that wasn't before in the yeah. prior plan. So. Great idea. You're, you're right. You're right, Estella. And just to clarify, um, the language of all of this, the vocabulary is very important. So virtual learning is the delivery model. It does. It's not synonymous with location. So that I think with the development of guidelines um, or standards of, um, we're going to be very like front and center with the, the the lexicon, if you will. So that we're all talking the same language. That we'll have that common vocabulary. And I'm glad you clarify that because then it 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 comes under the umbrella of equity. You know, it is a delivery model. It's like uh, a, a blackboard and an eraser. It's not. Um, you know, substitution for the pedagogy or for the things that need to happen under an equity lens. So thank you. Yeah. And that's a good point too. Um, I think in the spirit of this is what is the high impact practices that should be employed in designing a virtual learning experience? So it's very intentional. Um, it's not a substitution for what you're saying in the, the right pedagogy. And and I, oh, I'm sorry, Martha. No, no. First, you go with your question. I can wait. Are you sure? Yeah. All right, Irene. How how are you squaring that with what was just presented to us? Um, as it relates to Dessa, I mean, I, I think we we kind of I think Malia kind of got to that as as well, but I, I wanted to hear more squarely, like how how are you squaring that with 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 Dessa? I if I understand what you're, I mean, the alignment of that digital tool, that resource with this work, I think it's about meeting the needs of the students. So whatever the teachers are learning through that assessment process about what best fits the need of their students, then they would use the virtual learning guidelines or standards to create the best learning experience for those individuals. Um, if it's a technology question that you're asking, I'm not quite sure yet until we learn more and do the audit, but if it's specifically of knowing your child, knowing the student before you, and what are the right tools to put in front of them to ensure that they are successful in a virtual learning space, or even if they're in, in school on campus and they're accessing technology, again, they're matched with the right technology to support them and to show progress and achievement. Yeah. I think the DESA can form that that I think DESA can inform that teaching and learning process of what am I planning for the students in front of me? Got it. Yeah. So you're, I got you. My my center. My my question was really inspired by what I'm assuming is creating a real structure around virtual learning, while at the same time DESA DESA is really more adaptive in my opinion, right? And so those are very different kind of technical and adaptive. So how are you? How are you putting that together? So, but but you answer my question. Thank you. Your question. Uh, my my question was: Is this legislation going to put us on a path where all districts have to have a virtual learning policies programs like permanently going forward? Is this is where this is headed? I, all districts currently, based on the board approved um, or. I, I don't know what the right term is, but legislature, let's say, there are policies already in place at the local level for acceptable use of technology. I think this enhances that in the sense of if you are going to, and the thing is with virtual learning, use of technology and integration of technology has already been in place for years at the district level. It's just we've learned more in this experience after the March closure. So I think this will just help districts be more intentional about how you're integrating those digital tools in the teaching and learning process. So districts have, will, will it prompt revision of certain policies and as they call them now, I think regulations at the local level? Sure, I think that may happen. 
Um, but I don't, it's hard to believe that boards of ed don't have a current existing policy related to, to the use of technology. And I don't think it's called acceptable use anymore. Um, the name escapes me right now, but we can certainly follow up. There's a new language around it. Okay, great. Thank Martha, you for the clarification. Martha, is your question also about like, when you, you're you thinking virtual learning, are you thinking of like remote learning basically? Like will districts yeah. be required to provide sort of learn from home? So I think, um, you know, the current, and I think as Irene was saying, the current uh, practice of opting into learning from home is permissible under the COVID pandemic construct, if you will, right? So we have a policy now from the board that allows for it. We also have our addendum one guidance, which basically allows for that to happen. Uh, what it looks like, what that option particularly looks like next year is still an open question that's being discussed that has not been settled. Uh, right now, you know, uh, any parent that's uncomfortable with sending their kid in can opt into learning remotely and the district has to provide that remote learning. But what it looks like next year, uh, uh, will districts be required to provide that for anybody is still an open question. And that's what's being still discussed. What this, uh, this, these standards will help with is to clarify not just how technology is to be used, integrated, if the virtual learning is happening in the, in the building, if you will, with those tools. It will also speak to what it looks like when it's a, a remote day, if you will, so that it can you know, it can it can address both um, situations. Does that help? Yes, it is helpful. And I think my mind is going back and forth between both scenarios, right? The immediate impact of remote virtual and then also the future state of I'm attending and sitting in a high school classroom and my AP teacher is in some other building because we've pooled all of AP US history in this district or whatever the, you know version may be and just ensuring high quality, really everything going forward. That's, you know, I'm sure in everybody's minds. <laughs> no, exactly. I totally agree. And also, uh, I think the from uh, to add to what Irene was saying about SEL too is, uh, you know, and the DESA connection, Eric, you were sort of getting at, um, you know, SEL needs to be addressed in person and in remote worlds. And so, you know, th there are districts that have that have shared with us innovative practices of how they are being intentional about paying attention to SEL needs, even in a remote environment. So I think the DESA can just will just give us some or give teachers some insights into the strengths of their students in this area so that they can address it, whatever the medium of instruction be, be you know, so. Uh, the the last item that I had was the accountability waiver, and we've, we've discussed this. I've mentioned this at the board. And I, I sent you a link to the commissioner's memo that just went out, and I've put it again in the chat here just so that you have it. Um, it, it went out last week. It basically affirms that Connecticut got approval from the U.S. Department of Education on our accountability waiver. So what this basically means is that uh, we we assess this year to the best of our ability, but those scores are not to be used for school and district accountability. So the adults don't get held accountable for how kids do. It's the purpose of the testing this year is squarely to understand where kids are, so that we can help them uh, going help districts and help the kids going forward um, on a high quality measure. So it, it was a it was a big relief in some sense to have that official waiver and. And we have now formally communicated that to the districts as well. So, so that was that uh, uh, memorandum and communication. Uh, and that this, just one other point on that, reporting of results this year will look different. And I, I will say that affirmatively. Um, you know, uh, in past years, despite our best attempts, the press would go into a, uh, creating a horse race for our districts and and sort of even though we may not have formal accountability there is sort of like the test score ranking and 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 the stress that's put on educators even if there is not formal accountability 
So we have committed to uh, district and school leaders that we will work with them to uh, message this year's results appropriately in the context of this pandemic um, and how these scores uh, may or may not be comparable in certain cases, uh, especially if uh, participation is affected uh, at the district and school level. So we'll be, we'll, we are beginning those conversations with districts. We're, we're sort of thinking about how best to put this out uh, come June, July, when these results normally hit the, uh, hit the public space. So we'll be uh, very thoughtful and, and mindful about how we release results this year. Frankly, that should that should be the practice every year. So, what we do this year is is shouldn't be anything new. But um, we, given the the different nature this year, we'll be even more mindful uh, uh, in, with this year's results. So, I just wanted to mention that as well. Mm -hmm. so, Eric, if I, oh. if I may, before we conclude, I just want to say hello to Shandell and thank her for always taking great minutes. So, I, I see her there, and I'm glad she's smiling now. Thank you, Shandell. Thank you, Estella. Um, so that basically brings the topics for the agenda to a close, right. Eric. Um, yeah. Our next meeting is uh, set for uh, June 8th at 9.30. So um, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Ajit. Um, and Estella, you, you beat me to it. I was going to say hello to Shondell, and I also failed to say good morning to Irene, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, is there anything else? Nothing else to, to, to say or cover? All right, you all, uh, motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All right, motion to adjourn. Um, uh, uh, meeting adjourned. Uh, just you all have a powerful week. Thank you. You too, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Irene. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.